We are about to watch the end of America. That is to say, we are about to watch the end of America as the central geographic area of this particular era in Assassin's Creed history. I'm sure real-world America is doing just fine. This is a briefish history of Assassin's- SHIT! Now I'm on fire! Shit! Shit! Hey, remember that time none of you bought a PlayStation Vita? That's right, I'm blaming all of you for the commercial underperformance of my favorite handheld device. Shame on you. Unless you actually did buy one, viewer? In which case, the Sexual Favors Fairy will come deliver sexual favors to you tonight. Don't forget to put your genitals under your pillow, otherwise it won't work. Since Ubisoft has a crippling fear of not constantly drip-feeding itself your hard-earned cash, in between chugging down massive loads of your hard-earned cash, this just wouldn't do. I mean, they put a whole unique game on there, Liberation, and it only sold like almost 600,000 copies in the first few months? Psh, what is this, some sort of double-A release? We gots to get that into more people! Pronto! And thus was born Assassin's Creed Liberation HD, the Vita game dolled up and ported onto home consoles. It's definitely not identical, they dropped the 3 from the title. They also did the typical remaster thing where graphics and the models are better too, pretty self-explanatory. They also also made some pretty big tweaks. Mission objectives were changed for a smoother difficulty curve, they added tutorials and stuff to better explain the mechanics, and threw in 15 extra side missions, which are admittedly mostly bare-bones, dialogue-free missions that do the bare minimum. I did not hear a pun in that sentence. You're just loopy. Stop trying to gas lamp me. PlayStation trophies were also tweaked because the Vita list has some bullshit grindy nonsense, like climbing the equivalent distance of Mount Everest. Not a joke. You will have finished everything and will be stuck with hours more climbing ahead of you if you want the Vita Platinum. You also don't have to worry about multiplayer trophies now, because Liberation's garbage multiplayer went mysteriously missing from this remaster. At the end of the day, it's still Liberation. It's noticeably improved from the Vita version, but I still don't think it stacks up against any of the other PS3 offerings in the series. Of course, some would say Baneshake doesn't stack up against the other Assassin's Creed channels on YouTube, so I'll cut it some slack before people start to notice my own personal failings. Quick, look, over there! Aveline had to fight a bear in a dress in this version! It was a pun. I was the one gaslamping you this whole time. Based on the title alone, Assassin's Creed Memories doesn't really tell you much about the game. It's a better title than Assassin's Creed Pirates, marginally, but all of Assassin's Creed is centered around memories. It would be like an Inception spin-off titled Inception Dreams. Memories is yet another iOS spin-off game, this time a trading card game where you do some mobile game bullshit and then you possibly unlock the cards you're going for. Honestly, recollection of this one is really fuzzy. I barely played it back when it came out, and I didn't really like it, making Memories ironically one of the most forgettable Ascreed experiences. I couldn't play past the developer logos these days, naturally, as they have shut the servers down, but after how long I had to spend playing Ascreed Pirates last time, I'm not too broken up about it. With that in mind, I'm just gonna get the obligatory Assassin's Creed Memories would later go mysteriously missing from the App Store bit out of the way. <clears throat> yeah, that. With the advent of the 8th generation of consoles underway, Ubisoft had a dilemma. The PlayStation 4 and Xbox One would certainly be able to showcase some kick-ass next-gen hardware, but not everyone had gotten aboard the train of spending hundreds of dollary dues for a new rectangle. So it's a big, hungry corporation to do then, but release one more game simultaneously on the old hardware. Thus begat Assassin's Creed Rogue. 
which would later also be remastered and sold on the PS4 and X-Bone anyway. Money, bitches. It would not be entirely fair to just call Rogue Snowy Black Flag, but if I don't take this opportunity, I'll miss out on the pun, Shiver Me Timbers. So, Ascreed Rogue is like a Christmas Wonderland Black Flag. Shiver Me Timbers! <laughs> <laughs> Set during the Seven Years' War between Haytham's memories in Ascreed 3 and Connor's memories in Ascreed 3, we play as Shay Patrick Cormack. And if you can't tell from the name, Shay is about the most Irish motherfucker you could ever find. His accent ain't always that convincing, mind you, but based on the number of times he tells someone, I make my own luck, like he's the bastard son of a serial mascot, and an alternate universe gender-swapped version of said mascot having weird, pseudo-incestuous sci-fi leprechaun porking sessions. Clearly someone in the development team wanted my dumb ass to remember Shay's Irishness at all possible times. I would have just said Havana. The girls there have lusty buttocks and bosoms and feel no shame in putting them on display. Maybe next time just hire an Irish voice actor, Ubisoft. So, the main hook that sets this game apart from others in the series is that our main man goes through a messy breakup with the Assassins and then immediately hooks up with the Templars. Like a slut. Despite totally being a rebound relationship, they actually make it work in the long run. I'll get into the why when I talk about the story, but I'm more concerned now with the way the twist in the formula actually changes how the game is played. First is the way typical assassin activities get turned against you as you play. As you run around in the game world, post-breakup, assassins will be waiting on rooftops or in traditional hiding places like haystacks with the express intention of putting it deep inside you, senpai. Thankfully, Shay's eagle vision will begin to sniff out hiding assailants before they can strike, essentially using the detection radar from the multiplayer in games prior. For the first while, it's legitimately intimidating to hear the whispers indicating you are being stalked. Play long enough though, and it starts to have a different effect. I never once would have guessed that the phrase, God damn it, another woman is hiding nearby to pounce on me, would be a personal routine occurrence, but hey, here we are. It also applies to ship combat. You still go around doing your looty thing as a British privateer, but now, if an assassin ship gets the drop on you, they can board you instead leaving you on the defensive. This reversal also applies to side missions. Now you intercept the same type of messenger pigeons previous protags used to receive assassination targets. But instead of killing the target, you defend the target by killing all of the assassins after them. The finale of these is my favorite of the bunch. You show up to defend a high priority target, but lo and behold, the target wasn't real. This whole thing was a decoy and you are now the mission's target. Of course, being the hardcore gamer that I am, I totally survived the ambush. There are a few technological advancements in the years between Edward and Shay. Shay gets an air rifle in place of a blowpipe, which he stole from the Templars as an assassin, but conveniently uses the same types of poison darts the assassins have already been issuing for decades now, so it's essentially just a blowpipe you don't have to get to third base with. His ship gets a puckle gun in place of the swivel guns, and while the, like, two real-life puckle guns that existed didn't actually function like a modern-day machine gun, it's plausible enough at this point in the series' alternate history that someone could make a gun go boom fast. Shay also gets a goddamn motherfucking grenade launcher. And while this might sound real implausible, this actually lines up with the authentic hand mortar technology of the time. Other than that, the changes aren't too drastic from missions and gameplay the last few games have introduced. Prisoner of War ships function like Freedom Cry slave ships. Tough motherfucking legendary ships pretend to be more reasonable until the last one folds me up like origami for its sex dungeon. Nar wailing adds the wrinkle of bracing due to ice chunks, etc. There are plenty of things subtly improved upon. For example, the naval minigame can now skip straight to the end, which is nice, 
because the naval minigame is still dumb. There's more depth for hunting and crafting now, but it's definitely not anywhere near 3's depths. Also, to build on a confusing point from Black Flag, Shay not only crafts poison darts out of bones, but can also craft firecrackers and grenades out of a single bone. What the fuck are animals made out of in this universe? New York City is also back from 3, expanded slightly, making for the first time a full city has been explorable in more than one title in the series. You're a goddamn slut, New York City. Most of the changes just come from little details that distinguish the frigid Arctic North from the warmer Caribbean. You can tactically destroy icebergs to harm smaller ships, lending credence to my theory that the Titanic was actually a revenge killing. The game even puts in the attention to detail with Great Ox. While that might sound like the onomatopoeia of your asthmatic ants' orgasmic cries, I'm referring to these guys, a now extinct arctic bird that would have been around at the time. Rogue is also uniquely interested in continuity nods to the rest of the franchise, perhaps even more so than Ezio's sequels. And those games are the most closely connected games in the franchise. It calls back heavily to Black Flag and Freedom Cry. It calls a betwixt heavily to three. It even alludes to actions taken by unseen lore characters from goddamn Liberation. And that's just the history portion. The modern day gets really into things. Much like Black Flag analyzing the previous protagonists, Rogue has one of the Templar higher-ups exploring either Templars or Templar-adjacent characters from the other games when you play the shitty hacking minigames. There's a reference to goddamn 2 Discovery on the Nintendo DS. It even makes reference to the non-canon early comics by turning their plots into an intentional misinformation campaign the assassins created to mislead Abstergo down a dead-end road. This is the kind of continuity porn you might expect from Tolkien, and it's in Assassin's Creed Rogue, a game only a hair removed from being a spin-off instead of a main title. All this is nice dressing and all, but I like to look underneath at the content filling out these curves, and there's a few warts to address. Wart numero uno. The storytelling in this game is a little clumsier than what we are used to. The whole conceit of playing the Templar is neat, but it doesn't really delve into that as philosophically as it should. We'll address it in the story, but Shay's general ethics don't really change from that of assassins we've seen in the past. The plot could have switched the sides, and made Shay a Templar defecting to the assassins, and few details would have to change. Three, Black Flag, and even Liberation to a lesser degree, all looked at some fundamental reasons the Timps and the Assasses are incompatible despite their similarities. Rogue doesn't give a fuck. Pure circumstance drives Shay to the Plars, and the double asses have doubled their assery to make the transition more plausible. There are also a few points where poor communication is the only reason things happen the way they do. It could have used a smidge more nuance, really. Wart numero do? Busy work. This game's story is shorter than most main Ascreeds, which itself isn't really an issue since the length works well enough for what Rogue is. In fact, it's refreshing to replay an Ascreed that gets to the fucking point, considering the lengths of the most recent titles to date. However, as if to make up for it, there's a lot of side stuff fluff. Yes, most games in this series have the fluff of enough side stuff. With the shorter campaign here, even the same amount of filler would feel disproportionate, but this game may have more than usual. I did not measure this, do not treat it as empirical. Look at the requirements to unlock the 11th century Templar armor. It's the treasure maps system from Black Flag, where you find 24 maps, and then figure out where the hell it's trying to send you, then you go to those 24 locations to dig it up, Except instead of providing a reward for each instance, it's all for one single unlockable costume. Honestly, a mid-tier costume at that. Upper mid, sure. But this game already has more drip than most of the others, and I got this bitch in white and red Templar outfit from beating the legendary ships prior, so this much busy work for other suits feels like a chore. 
Not to mention that the Knights Templar came about in the 12th century, not the 11th, so they couldn't even get the name of the armor right. There are basically all of the collectibles from Black Flag, but now there are even more, like Prosperity, which, like the Animus Data Fragments, is not a tangible thing in the historical world for Shay to give a great ox ass about, and instead is just a thing for the featureless void that is the modern-day character, which I did say with quotation marks, thank you for noticing. See, these Prosperity Diamonds are just hacks to increase how fast money comes into the bank. That's right, Rogue reintroduces Ezio's monetary system, upgrading businesses around the game world to earn more frequent deposits than your dad at an all-you-can-glory-hole buffet. And the system is kind of mega-broken at this point. Even if you ignore half of the economic growth opportunities, you will quickly have more money coming in than you can even use. Literally. You will run out of things you have any reason to buy. You can just buy all of the animal parts you need for upgrade crafting, and you'll still have money. I strolled into a store and said, I'll take your finest white whale skin. No, make it several. Now, maybe they could have used this as commentary on how capitalism pools too much profit for the wealthy few, where they hoard it eternally and make life actively worse for everyone else. It would fit the Templar M.O., since this series canonically established capitalism as a tool used by the Templars to oppress and control the populace very early on, but I don't think it was intentional here. Every time you get paid, it doesn't tell you in period-authentic currency, like, you know, the rest of the series. It literally just says, you have 69420 money in the bank. Someone just didn't care. Remember last time when I bitched about the weapon select sucking? Because it's ever so slightly worse here. Previously, melee options were all up or down and tools were left or right, so if you needed to switch quickly, it was natural enough that you could eventually memorize it. They've fucked it up further. All the melee weapons are now just on the left, so switching from hidden blades to swords for a fight is much less smooth, and the tools take up everything else. Darts and grenades get exclusive up and down access, respectively, but with two-thirds of both sharing the same functions, just on an individual versus crowd control distinction, I'm not sure they needed that much priority for messing up the ergonomics. And yes, the weapon wheel is still replaced by a button for collectible tracking, just like Black Flag, and it's still completely useless here. One last gripe, Shay simply recycles all of Edward Kinway's animations. Adewale got brand new animations for his four-hour DLC experience, and yet they couldn't be asked to do the same for a full sequel. Now, dual-wielding swords would feel a little out of place with the tone here, so instead Shay uses a sword and dagger, identically to dual-wielding swords. And since most of Shay's costumes lack a hood now, Edward's animation for raising his hood in restricted areas just makes Shay pop his collar in the face of danger. Story time. Asgreed Rogue starts out with Shay monologuing about leaving the assassins, and our first memory shows right off the bat him sneaking up on an assassin, ready to strike. Nah, they just wrestle him. Shay, who is still a novice assassin with questionable facial hair, and Liam, his more experienced buddy, are out on a mission for the assassins. There's also egalitarian assassin master Louis-Joseph Gaultier Chevalier de la Verendre, who is constantly just a prick to Shay. Ah, the cabbage farmer has returned. He's such a punk-ass bitch that he's actually the tutorial for fighting because he goes to smack a bitch for disrespecting. They steal a ship right away, because it's obligatory that the playable character is inexplicably both captain and his own helmsman at this point in the series. Our historical frivolity is broken up by everyone in Abstergo Entertainment freaking the fuck out. Turns out, someone booby-trapped Shay's memories with a virus which has put the whole building on the fritz. We are playing again as a silent, unnamed protagonist. Not the same silent, unnamed protagonist as Black Flag, mind you. It specifies that this is a different featureless void, if you dig into it, for whatever reason. Whoever the fuck you is, is awoken by Violet DaCosta, a security contractor whose personality begins with being a hard-ass, and ends with being the exact same hard-ass. 
She does mock Melanie LeMay, though, which is valid. You haven't forgotten your boss, have you? Melanie LeMay, zipper, chipper, overachiever? Since you were the one doing your job correctly and simply happened upon genetic files you couldn't have known were booby-trapped, you're punished by being stuck working when everyone else gets evacuated. Because a different higher-up really wants to study Shay. We'll meet him later. Back in the not-present, Shay returns to the Assassin Homestead where we see a younger, more optimistic Achilles leading things. His wife and son will die off-screen a couple missions later and for some reason that'll weigh him down pretty heavily. We also see old man Adewale and find out he's still mostly operating around the Caribbean and Port-au-Prince like he was doing in Freedom Cry. If you stop and eavesdrop on Achilles and Ade, it actually cues you in a few minutes early on some details. The box he had before is a translation-y box for an unreadable manuscript that can lead to some Isu temples, but an assassin working for Liberation's lore characters went looking for one and then went missing in an earthquake. A few other assassins, Hope Jensen, Kasigo Wase, and Liam are the ones primarily training Shay in the usual assassin sneaky, climby, shoot we beastsy stuff. They're kind of dickish to Shay, except Hope also just randomly gets real horny for a snippet. You certainly know how to handle yourself. She also runs a bunch of assassin gangs in the broader New York area. Gangs of New York, if you will. And we have the second game where Assassin's Creed uses top hats anachronistically too early. Assassin's Creed, see me after class. Achilles gives Shay the details about the Templars, taking the box and the manuscript. And let me tell you something, Shay is way more efficient at taking down Templars than most other protagonists. I often do shorthand to not bog down my videos, you know, more than I already do. But I don't really have to here. These missions happen in rapid succession. He goes after Lawrence Washington, brother of George, first, and we find out why the Templars never tried to recruit George in three. Lawrence asked them not to. That is logical. Shay is clearly conflicted over killing an already dying man, but Larry's like, nah bro, this is so much better than slowly dying a painful death at the hands of tuberculosis. Thanks! Also, I already sent the MacGuffins away. So, Shay immediately goes and gets the box from Samuel Smith, a man with the most generic name possible. He then immediately goes to get the manuscript from a Templar named James Wardrop. And like that, we have ended the fastest MacGuffin hunt in Assassin's Creed history. Shay had watched the penis Templar from Assassin's Creed 3 recruiting Ben Franklin to strike the box with lightning, and since he knows nothing about the secret conspiracies, Shay and Hope are able to stroll right in and say, yup, we're definitely BFFs forever with William Johnson. Go ahead and just do the lightning thingy with us instead. Benny Boy gets electrocuted for a few moments, which lines up with Ben Franklin IRL. So he doesn't get to see the box translate the manuscript into a hologram indicating a precursor site in Lisbon, Portugal. Shay gets to go and secure the Isu artifact because he has a history of none fucking. Not a joke. It's a convent, right close by the harbor. I might have visited the sisters once or twice. And then there's the maids I met in Lisbon. Destined for the convent they were, dark-eyed and kindly disposition. If only I'd spoke Portuguese. Not that we spent much of our nights talking. Damn, it feels good to be a gangster. I made a meme about it. So Shay goes to Lisbon and gets to parkour across a cathedral in a bit very reminiscent of the assassin tombs in Ezio's games. So it's very nostalgic until he touches a spiky, floaty thingy deep underground and then the city starts fucking exploding, forcing you to flee past a major metropolitan area crumbling around you civilians screaming and dying by the implied thousands. It's such a massive earthquake that it takes you nearly five minutes of full sprinting to escape. Shay looks back in horror at the carnage he inadvertently caused. The Great Lisbon Earthquake, one of the deadliest quakes in human history. Now, thankfully, a ship sailing from Europe to North America is going to be at least a month, likely longer depending on the ship, 
so Shay has plenty of time to process what happened, collect his thoughts, and explain to the assassins what happened like a grown-up. He does nothing of the sort, flying off the handle in a blind rage, accusing Achilles of being a big ol' murderer. Apparently, he just raged endlessly on a boat for a month. For some reason, the other assassins don't respond well to this, and they throw him out of the room. He sneaks back in to steal the manuscript so it can't happen again, which Achilles interprets as outright betrayal, which, to be fair, it is? And tells the other assassins to catch him. Hope actually asks Shay to stop so they can reason with him as he flees. But everyone else interprets this much worse. Chevalier, for example, interprets this as shelling the fucking cliffs with his ship. They corner Shay, and Hope tries to reason with him again, but someone shoots him in the back, and he falls the equivalent of several stories neck first where his limp body slides into the water, and he is implicitly carried out to sea. Now, I'm no trained mediator, but can anyone spot some places where better communication could have averted this outcome? I can count at least nine. Much to the Abstergo crew's surprise, the Animus briefly jumps ahead about 20 years or so later, where Shay not only survived, but is mysteriously hunting criminals in Paris. They appear to be hunting Ben Franklin, but the memory rejects them early, because we all know the Animus is a freaking Lil Tease. We eject briefly from the freaking Lil Tease to meet the guy running the show face to face. This guy, Juhani Otso Berg, commonly just called Otso, Berg, he's a middle name, last name kind of a guy, has actually come up in the series before. He was the guy from the multiplayer who succeeded at the Animus training program stuff. We talked about him here. Jesus fucking Christ, six episodes ago. In addition to being a Shay Cormac fanboy, he's a high-ranking Templar special operative, and he makes it very clear he has a specific plan involving Shay's memories. So, we hop back into Shay Awakening in the presumable months after playing pogo stick with his neck <gasps> to a kindly Irish couple, nursing him back to health. Despite the fact that they will appear for approximately two scenes before disappearing from the game, Barry here is somehow even more of an Irish stereotype than Shay. They get briefly interrupted by the assassin-affiliated gang for protection money before giving Shay his possessions back, along with some clothes that belong to their late son. Shay decides kicking the local gangsters out would be great physical therapy before meeting British Colonel George Monroe, who is friends with the Irish couple and would like to help Shay. To be very clear, this part of the game is a strong example of two sides both knowing who the other party is and suspecting that they, themselves, are also known. Shay was given clothes that clearly include Templar imagery and he spent a long time hunting the British-aligned Templars. He's not stupid, usually, so there's no way he missed who these people are. Likewise, Monroe has found a dude with more penetration tools than your local sex shop, and the custom air rifle that got stolen directly from the Templars recently. Neither of them broached the topic for a full year. While Shay's perspective is one of being given a second chance to do what's right by a former enemy far more accepting and forgiving than he would have expected, there's a darker undercurrent here. At the surface level, Monroe is friendly, supportive, and completely unassertive. He appears to be offering general guidance, at most. But he is manipulating Shay like a goddamn puppet. For one, he starts off by surrounding Shay with new allies, but they are watching him to assess his trustworthiness ready to kill him at a moment's notice if he appears to be a threat. One of said allies outright admits it later on. This alone wouldn't constitute manipulation since that is just a security measure here in the Secret Conspiracy Employment Division, but there's more to it. Early on, Shay takes out an assassin spy he met at the start of the game and finds out in the memory corridor that he was delivering some poison gas to the assassins. Poison is something of a specialty for Hope, and since bursting has the effect of the poison darts you use, it's likely standard assassin stuff. This is backed up by the fact that BF gives Shay the grenade launcher designed for Hope because he thinks Shay and Hope are still friends since no one tells him about the conspiracy stuff. So all signs just point to this being gear production for field operating assassins. 
Monroe paints a different picture for Shea. He's making equipment to spread gases among the populace. Toxic ones, as it turns out. The populace. I thought they would use it against the authorities. Though that would be terrible as well. It's vague, as the game doesn't give any other indication what the Assassinos are or aren't planning. But this does seem like an outright lie to Gaslamp Shea. Look, Achilles' American assassins currently have a mediocre track record with the Stay Your Blade from Innocence tenant. Even when they aren't accidentally causing large-scale shaken baby syndrome, the assassin-affiliated gangs are obviously willing to get way out of line on civilians, as gangs are prone to do. But a gas attack on civilians is way out of character, even considering everything else. Monroe's bluff works, and Shay absolutely succumbs to the Templar seductions. So one year on, Monroe fesses up to the I know you know I know you know game, and even gives Shay the manuscript back, which he had taken off of his soggy half-corpse, because Shay has fully earned his trust. The assassins promptly discover Shay is still alive while trying to murk Monroe, and since they're both ass targets now, they play a few rounds of you take it. No, you take it. Eventually, Shea convinces Monroe to keep him. But while Shea's distracted killing Kasigo Wase, Liam slips in, stealing the manuscript and killing Monroe. I was wrong previously, Shea actually is a fucking moron. At this point, though, he's proved himself thoroughly and officially gets inducted into the New World Order fan club. Interestingly, despite the fact that Hatham's posse from 3 is alive and well at this point in the timeline, we don't really interact with them all that much. Willie Johnson appears in a few brief scenes, and Charles Lee cameos in the Templar ceremony, but the rest are just... the uh, fucking elsewhere, I guess. Despite limited screen time, the newly introduced allies are still pretty interesting. Christopher Gist, your first mate, is very much the lovable rascal who likes to clan around just enough that he isn't obnoxious yet. And he delivers every line in this endearingly ham and cheese way that I cannot get enough of. There's also Jack Weeks, a super cool strategist who always wears some dapper green shades and helps you perform a false flag gang attack so the British forces will finally kick them from the greater New York area. The next one, who is technically not a Templar, as he's too fucking chatty to keep secrets, is Captain James Cook, who inexplicably has a god-awful attempt at a Scottish accent, even though he was raised in England. Tell me the truth. Are you fellows with a larger organization? The Board of Admiralty. You take your orders directly from His Majesty, don't you? The one big recurring Templar, of course, is Grand Master Haytham Kinway, whose depiction is impeccably on brand. Oh, maybe you'll find him there! Not that. She's in that big mansion. The one with the gardens. We get another flash forward to Shea in France midway in. He protects Ben Franklin from the criminals. Now, you might be wondering who these criminals are, since they just reuse the generic orange gangsters from the rest of the game. The French assassins don't use street gangs, and there's little reason to think the assassins in Europe want Franklin dead. But you can go fuck yourself. This game ain't gonna explain shit. In return for his protection, Shea asks Benny Boy to get him into the Palace of Versailles, and we backtrack to the main time period. Hunting down the remaining assassins is an inevitability, considering Connor later has to come find a single old man limping around in utter defeat, but it doesn't make it less emotional. The hardest hitting is taking down Adewale. This man was a playable character. He spent decades fighting for the freedom of slaves. You personally have to murder him. Hope recreates the hologram experiment, so she's up next. Despite bringing Shay two stories down through a window and briefly poisoning him with a toxin that will stop his heart if he quits running, he still makes quick work of her. Honestly, she doesn't even take it that personally. He's pretty broken up about killing her, though, for some reason. You certainly know how to handle yourself. 
Louis-Joseph Gaultier, Chevalier de la Verendre, tries to stop you from catching up to the assassin expedition, but I don't feel bad about killing him. Fuck off, dickbag. Finally, Shay and Haytham get to the remote precursor site slightly after Achilles and Liam. And here's the part that really stings. Nothing Shay has done since abandoning the assassins changes the outcome. Achilles actually did take Shay's information into consideration, and when he is able to look at the device directly for like five seconds, he's like, fuck, that is an earthquake stabilizer. Even if he hadn't, it's so remote, no civilians would have died, and the assassins would still have learned not to fuck with these anymore. So it's doubly excess bloodshed. Liam reveals that Chevalier is the one who shot Shay on the cliff last time. Shocker, shocker. But Liam's willing this time! Achilles actually moves to defend Shay, but their Raslin knocks the device over and they cause an earthquake anyway. Liam ends up landing brain first in a fall. Shay convinces Haytham not to kill Achilles, since he's not a threat without a surviving brotherhood, and so he can warn the other assassins globally not to make his mistakes. Valid points. Haytham assigns the NPCs we didn't meet slash murder in 3 to go on assassin hunting expeditions elsewhere in North America, explaining their absence from that game, but Shay is specifically tasked to go find where the assassins sent the precursor box. This memory pleases Otso Berg, so his master plan is revealed. He has you upload the footage to harass the surviving modern assassins. The whole game was for a cyberbullying campaign. Ha ha. Look at this time your people died. Somehow, this will not be the least significant Assassin's Creed modern day plot stakes. Somehow, this will not be the least significant Assassin's Creed modern day plot stakes in a game released on November 11th, 2014. I'll elaborate next time to do the subscribe thing. Violet's like, I guess we should resolve that French shit that keeps happening. So, you go back in for one more memory. Franklin gets Shay entrance to Versailles, and we're basically crisscrossing with Unity's prologue. See this dweebus kid? We'll be this dweebus kid next time. Shay kills his dad for the precursor box. In his dying moments, this guy, Charles Dorian, mocks Shay, saying all his efforts are for naught thanks to Connor and the American Revolution. It's all well and good until you realize that this scene happens in 1776, when the revolution is young and Connor has most certainly not taken out all the Templars yet. Like, it's a lucky guess for Charles, because his bluff will come to pass, but I just suspect the writers didn't double check their work. You almost broke the cannon there, dickholes. Shay decides that, perhaps, the Templars should start a violent civil war of their own, here in France, showing that he has slipped off the slope of being concerned about civilian casualties sometime in the 20 years of unseen Templaring, and possibly explaining what he was doing instead of returning the precursor box to Haytham in 3. The end. Except then we get a mid credit scene where Violet, Melanie, and Otso offer the first person employee a choice between joining the Templars or getting fucking shot. Wonder what they picked. Real the end. So, there goes America. Again, in the games. You'll have to let me know in the comments if America ended IRL. There's a delay between writing, recording, editing, and uploading, so who even knows? Next time, we get to look exclusively at Unity, much like we did for Black Flag in its episode. Considering the people who love Unity will probably hate any criticisms I level at it, the people who hate Unity will probably dislike positives I have about it, and the people who are indifferent to Unity will dislike how much time I'm about to devote to Unity. I think I'm about to be fucked regardless. Like and subscribe if you want to see me get fucked regardless. <laughs>